I wanted to make my dad's life count. To know that he didn't die in vain. This is a picture of all 44 who were killed. See, my dad was killed on uh, United Flight 629 that blew up within 11 minutes of takeoff from Stapleton Airport over beet fields in Weld County. And the tail was over here in one corner of the field and the nose was like a mile and a half apart in the other and there were victims all over, debris all over, the engines of the plane, the impact was so strong, it, the engines formed a crater about 16 feet deep and um, someone somewhere found my dad because my dad was a, a passenger on that flight. He was 31 years old. Left my mother who um, was pregnant with me, so I wasn't born yet, and with my younger sister at 15 months old. But someone found him, covered him, and then stayed by him to make sure that looters, because looters were coming on board to loot the bodies. And it was just a huge mayhem that went on in that field that night and for the days that followed. And debris, I understand, flew like six miles, beyond six miles, the mail was strewn all over the place. It was such a major catastrophe. And as I wrote that chapter in my book, I knew I wanted to come to thank all those communities. There's uh, no memorial, no plaque, no roadside marker, no nothing. I assumed my dad was one of the early ones to be identified because he was a veteran in World War II and they already had his fingerprints. I began really wanting to come out and to visit those speed fields. But as I wrote um, the portion of my book called Meanwhile Back in Denver about what happened here, that's um, when I saw a different picture. I didn't want to talk about the crime. I didn't want to talk about the criminal. I didn't want to talk about the court case. All the time when there's a national tragedy like this, the focus is always on the criminal always on the crime and nothing on the families that are left to pick up with the pieces. And I saw the American spirit like I've never seen before. I realized that it took massive human resources, massive team of people living in the surrounding communities who heard the explosion, their houses shook, you know, they saw the ball of fire up, up in the sky and um, and many of them, like Conrad Hopp, he and his wife were first on the, on the field to discover such mayhem. And they began covering up the bodies as they found them. We had just finished eating what we call supper on the farm. Supper. And, and uh, matter of fact, I think we were still at the table and the loud blast that shook all the windows. We thought some of the windows were even coming in and we jumped up and ran outside. The ball of fire was coming through the sky and the motors were wild, revved up. You could just, you knew it was an airplane. And uh, about the time we got to my car, we lost sight of the plane behind the barn. But we knew it had landed, we thought actually on our farm but it only was missed that maybe 150 or 200 feet. My dad and I ran outside and I remember all the roads were white with lights. Everybody wow. was already out in the car going to see And it us. was just wow. right out here is where it blew up. Wow. Just right out here. When we got out of the, um, on the road, there was already debris on the road. Wow. Just down here at the just corner. Just down here. Um, it seemed like silverware trays and just debris. And this was a 160 acre farm where the bodies were on and to cross those ditches a two-ton truck would do it but a car or a small vehicle would get stuck. This is where I live. Come so we drove the truck around each body so that it could be found easily. So we drove around all all that area, and uh, that's, 
That's what we did. So that we could drive around and, and then signal once we went around so someone could say by the body and then we would look for another one. <coughs> and I think that was about four o'clock in the morning when I finally took her back here because she was lived right here next door where we're at mm. now because she had to go to school. But I don't think that I probably went to bed for two days because we were busy even the next day still looking for bodies. We didn't find them all that night. Wow. And finding a body was r really fairly simple, but later on to try to pick that body up and put it in a body bag is, uh, that, was, that was the tough part. So while back here, Conrad and Martha and all the others were so busy, working with the bodies. My mother is in shock. She went to bed, she took my dad to the airport in Philadelphia that, mo that morning, that day, and waved goodbye to him at the airport. And she said that she was very uneasy with him going on this trip. Something was gnawing in her spirit. But she went on home, she's tired, pregnant with me, and goes to bed early. So she didn't listen to the nightly news like she normally would have. She went on to bed. And it wasn't until 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. here, two hours after the plane explosion, that she hears pebbles thrown at her bedroom window. And she looked out the window going, what in the world's going on? And down stood her OBGYN, her pastor, and my dad's best friend. Those three men knew each other heard the news, contacted each other, and came to tell my mother the news. And at the time that she let them in the door, the front door, ran downstairs to go, what in the world's going on? She hears her phone ring and it's her sister in Tennessee, because now the nation knew what had happened. And her sister heard the news, and then she told me, she says, Marion, I just ran upstairs, it was a two-story home, ran upstairs, picked up your sister, she's 15 months old, and I screamed, gut level screams over and over and over again. That's what happened that night. These here, my mom brings these out, and they still have the FBI tags on them. My dad's cufflinks. I just felt I had a, a bit of my dad with me. Huge thing, I, I just cherish these, is watch he wore. And I'm thanking God that he was not looted, that we actually have these. I wasn't born yet. I was six months. My mother was six months pregnant with me, and I came prematurely at the end of December um, due to her d distress, her trauma. I had a great sense of loss of something I never had, which even made the loss even greater. The what-ifs, the could-ifs, the should-ifs. I didn't hear his voice, I didn't feel his touch. I, I, I didn't know him and I wanted to be held by dad and I couldn't be. So it was a deeper, strangely a deeper kind of loss at what I lacked in life growing up was, was knowing him and um, having him around. and. Um, all through my life at like 11 o'clock at night when my stepdad was in bed as I was an adult I would ask my mom like every several years a question about my real dad but it wasn't until I was age 42 that um, by circumstances my mother told me this, her story for the first time in my entire life And when she told me that and shared her story, what happened that night, November 1st, 1955, it really accelerated the healing. It's more real. It's more real. There was real tragedy here. My mother lost the love of her life. Her whole life, what got shattered, changed instantly overnight. She was traumatized which affected me growing up. But coming here, I knew that 
from talking with Conrad that it has been a traumatizing event for him in his life. You coming here has helped me. Wow. Oh. I really do. Because I can talk better today than I could the other day, if you notice. Yeah. But on the 50th anniversary, <laughs> you know, the, the big write-up in the articles, and, and we had four children, and they said, Dad, you've never told us about that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I really didn't ever want to talk about that. Yeah. I had already begun wanting to know my real dad and began seeking for him. And it took me on a whole healing journey that I didn't expect. And that healing journey took me in the process. After three years of doing almost nonstop crying, all this repressed grief, emotions, because my mom's trauma poured into me. And that's factual. The, uh, they, they now know it, that women who have been traumatized while carrying babies, their hormones pour into the babies. And so um, through all this type of healing, I was finally led. And I didn't want to. I'm being real honest and real, real. But I knew I couldn't be totally free until I forgave the man who killed my dad. I couldn't say his name until then. I didn't care who he was. I didn't even want to read about the court case. So it was very um, heart, heart wrenching. And it was by the grace of God that I could, I could forgive him because I didn't want to. That repressed anger, hate, bitterness, everything surfaced. The deep longings, deep grief. I was a basket case. I'll just be honest. <laughs> I was a basket case, and I had no idea the impact that this one evil act had on my, on my life, on my mother's life. But in 2018, I realized it was time to write my story. And as I wrote my story called um, Finding My Father, Beyond Tragedy Through Trauma and Into Freedom, I wrote it from the perspective of my dad that I found real peace. And that's why I can be here today to tell my story. That's why I could write my book. That's why I couldn't have done it before. I w wanted to help other people going through tragedy. And, you know, tragedy is all relative. It's like to what's tragic to one person is different for another person. So I know locally here you have the Aurora, you have Columbine, you have all kinds of things in the history in this area. But tragedy is tragedy and pain is pain. So I wrote the book so that people could perhaps find their own healing, their own hope, and their own inspiration that they too will make it. In your imagination, maybe you think about mm -hmm. what your conversation would go like if he could just walk into the room. Like, what, what would the first conversation be? What would you want to talk to him about? What would you ask him? I think I would hug him and cry. If he were to walk through the door right now, I would be in tears, crying and just letting him hold, hold me. That would be it. And his life would go on. I could see him laughing. He and my mom loved to dance. Um, he probably would have taken a skiing, you know. <laughs> we have done all the fun things that a father would do with their daughters and that we missed in life. And he he would be there for counseling, you know, you know, you, you ask dad questions. I couldn't ask my stepdad questions, but I'd be able to sit and say, Dad, what do you think about this? Dad, what do you think about this? You know, or that. You know, should I do this or that? And I, I think it just, it would change. I wouldn't be the same person. Probably more mature, more confident. <laughs> more mature. <laughs> uh, for confidence, uh, that's how I picture it. Close to that is where the tail was. What has forgiveness done for you? How has forgiveness? Oh, wow, that's deep. It lifted a burden 
that I was carrying all these years. It lifted the bitterness, the anger, the hatred. You see that little hump in the field out there, just in front of us? About from there to where the motors went into the ground is where all the bodies were. It totally changed me. Totally freed me from allowing my dad's death to actually control me. Does that make sense? Like, I, I could not say the man who killed my dad until I went through that forgiveness, and I didn't want to. And I still don't like saying his name, <laughs> you know? And um, forgiveness was so freeing. It was, it was the best thing I ever did, but it's difficult. So the bodies were over 160 acres, you said? Mm -hmm. My goodness. And I've learned that some people want to force people to forgive. Oh, just forgive and forget. No, because you're always going to have that memory. I still have that memory of my dad. You know, we're out on the beet fields. I didn't even want to imagine him on that beet fields, to be honest. So I don't go there when I'm out there. Um, but so the pain is still, your memory of the pain is going to be there. But how I'm able to share about it has changed. I can freely share about it because it's not holding me back. The resentfulness or the, the longing, that forgiveness was a huge key, huge, and that was pretty much the seal. Thus, my book is called Beyond, Finding My Father Beyond Tragedy, Through Trauma and Into Freedom, and it gave me freedom like I never felt before. I, I can't explain it anymore. I'm just now thinking that dad, I'll be back. And I know he's not here. So symbolic that I'll be back.